people need the Lord. People need the Lord. At the end of broken dreams is the open door. People need the Lord. People need the Lord. When will we realize that people need the Lord? People need the Lord. People need. sing this song before our lesson. You are good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace, you are peace when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in your death has lost its sting. And oh, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever reign. You are more, you are more than my words will ever say. You are Lord, you are Lord. All creation will proclaim, you are here, you are here, in your presence I may hold. You are God, you are God, of all else I'm letting go. And oh, I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever reign. I'm running to your arms, I'm running to your arms, the riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace, light of the world forever Sing no other name. 
nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. Light of the world forever reign. Amen. Be seated. Amen. Well, I have been looking forward to this series for about a year now uh, when it was kind of birthed in my spirit and just uh, been thinking about it for a while. And if you haven't been able to tell uh, by looking at the stage, this is a series entitled The Race. And uh, one of the amazing things is as we look into the Word of God and as we uh, dive into Scripture, we see this metaphor of the race used several times and this this idea of running and this this parallelism to the life of discipleship and so uh, that's what we're going to dive into for the next few weeks uh, as we uh, jump into God's word and kind of look what what uh, writers there have to say about it and what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us through the word of God I want you to take a moment though and just look at the stage with me and some of the things that are up here you'll you'll notice there's a set of lockers up here on the stage and and as we walk through this series I want to ask you the question uh, what gear are you stirring in your own life storing in your own life as it relates to uh, how you are preparing and what you are wearing you know the the Word of God says that we are to clothe ourselves with certain things here's a track jersey here and there's some shoes here in this locker and there's also some a water cooler down here and and how are you staying hydrated in your own race? Uh, you see these hurdles up here. I want you to think of some hurdles that you've encountered along your own journey. Some hurdles that you have come up in contact with in your own life. Maybe it's a hurdle that you're going over right now or going through right now. Um, and I will. I will not attempt to jump any of these hurdles uh, right now so that, uh, so that I don't embarrass myself completely, but really think about some of the hurdles that you're going through in your own life. You know, my idea was when I, when I thought about this series even a year ago, I thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prepare and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run, I'm going to run in a race. I'm going to run in the Mercedes 5K, which was yesterday, and that was, that was my plan all along. And uh, I, I was working toward that. Well, I, re- I really wasn't training. I was just thinking. You know, I was running in my mind. And I was running in my mind toward, toward this, this date. And, uh, and then a couple of weeks ago, I had a spot cut off behind my ear where I got some stitches back there. And they said, don't do any vigorous exercise until you get your stitches out. So, whew. <laughs> thank you, Lord. <laughs> Didn't have to run that race. But, uh, but I had planned on, I'd planned on doing that, and uh, I've actually shot some videos. You can find them on my Facebook page, and I'll be showing them in the weeks to come, some videos with Jim Doris and I, who is actually running in the race uh, today, and, and those will be forthcoming. But I want you to pull out your word, uh, the Bible, and let's turn to a few passages as we think about this topic and think about what, what God has to say through us uh, through this metaphor. 2 Timothy 4, 7 is the first stop I want to make. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, Paul says. I have kept the faith. Verse 8. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Just flip over a few pages in your New Testament. Paul says these words, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Verse 25, Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. As the guy in Sandlot says. 1 Corinthians 9, 26, therefore I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I want you to go on with me to Hebrews chapter 12, and this is kind of going to set the stage for our message today. Hebrews chapter 12, uh, I had the opportunity to read the book of Hebrews this past week, and, and I want to encourage you to do that. It doesn't take very long, it's, it's, it's a relatively short letter, 
but the Hebrew writer packs some, some very, very pertinent, life-transforming things into this book. And uh, Robert Reed is actually teaching a series on Hebrews uh, here on Sunday mornings. And, and this verse in particular has jumped out and grabbed me for years, but, but in relation to this series, it has really been one that I've gravitated toward. The writer says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race, the race, just any race, the race marked out, for us. Look at verse 2. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, inevitably, in the race of life, we tend to encounter, like we just talked about a moment ago, we tend to encounter some hurdles. It's not always smooth sailing, so to speak, as evidenced by this video right here. If we can cue, cue up that video. This was a news interview that took place uh, this past week. And if we can get it up there, I want you to see. I caught up with Chelsea happened. and Michael who were jogging by and were nice to just stop for a quick second. And I said, what are you doing running? And you're saying it was really good out? It's the perfect texture for running. Very low impact on its dry snow so your feet don't get wet. Oh, what have you seen while you've been out running? It's been a lot of fun. There's a lot of other runners and more skiers than runners for sure. I think they've got a little bit of the advantage with the yeah. whole stride and glide thing. But it's too nice to not be out here. Keep on the run. Sorry to have kept you, but I appreciate you guys talking with us. Stay warm. All right, thanks. We've seen a lot of people out here, like you said, running sledding just enjoying it one thing oops now that can happen that can happen looks like Chelsea's okay you okay they uh yes okay I do not I do not know this young lady who took this spiel I trust that she's okay pray that she's okay but in life this is life this this happens we think oh I've got the perfect texture this is my plan I've planned it all out I've strategized completely. This is, this is the perfect path. This is the perfect running weather. And then, kaboom. Anybody ever been there? Mm. Anybody ever been there? And I asked, my, I asked this question in my mind. Why, is, why does Paul use this metaphor over and over again? And I want you to look in your notes, and in your notes you'll see there's some blanks that you can fill in today, and we're going to look at what we call starting blocks. In every race, most good runners have a, a starting block that gets them kind of propelled in the right direction and gets them started off right. And so today, the big idea is this, is choose the right race. Are you choosing the right race? race and you'll probably understand a little bit more about what we mean by that as we go on but look at in your notes number one these starting blocks to help us get off on the right foot number one is that everybody is running after something everybody is running after something and Jesus teaches us this he says that that everybody is a seeker he says that every person is in pursuit of something and Jesus says that it's, it's not so much the, the problem of, of folks that are, are, most people are actually chasing the, the external. Most folks are actually chasing the external instead of chasing the eternal. And I want you, if you have your Bibles, uh, turn over to Matthew chapter 6. I want to look at this because what you're running after is affected by tomorrow and the reality is, is that you can't control tomorrow. Has anybody ever tried to control tomorrow? Anybody ever, ever any, if you ever try to control tomorrow? And the reality is, is that we can't. Look what Jesus says about this. He says, you know a lot about a person and what they're running after by how much they worry. Matthew 6. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, or what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? 
Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? I love the song that his eye is on the sparrow. And I know that he watches over me. Jesus goes on to say, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. In verse 33, a song that we just sang a moment ago, but... But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all of these things will be given to you as well. Verse 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And notice what Jesus is not saying here. Jesus is not saying, stop running. Hey, you guys over here, stop. Stop it. Stop. Stop running. Jesus is not saying stop running. Instead, his message is examine your life because you may need to get back on track. You may, you may need a course correction in your own life. Most of us read this text from the Sermon on the Mount, this, this powerful sermon that we should probably read not just once every couple years. We should probably read it every week. Matter of fact, we should probably read it every day. But we read this text in the Sermon on the Mount and we say, you know, if I were to be honest with myself, some of us in this room may, may be concerned about where the next meal is coming from, but most of us are not. Some of us may be concerned about whether or not we're going to have clothes to wear, but most of us are not. And so we, we read this and we, we fly right by it and we say, Jesus, I'm good. I don't have to worry about those things. We've been blessed. That's our word. We've been blessed. And we have been blessed. But it tends to, it tends to, to be in our culture, it tends to be in my own life that I've noticed that, that I, I, I tend not to worry about what I'm going to eat or, or what I'm going to wear, but I... I tend to overemphasize, I tend to place a lot of weight in building bigger barns, if you will. I tend to place a lot of emphasis on accumulating more and more stuff instead of what? Instead of seeking first the kingdom. And Jesus says, why, why are you wearing yourself out? trying to accumulate more of what is going to be someone's future garage sale. Now, I'm not against garage sales. Matter of fact, we're going to be having a yard sale uh, here in a few weeks. And so bring your stuff. Uh, all proceeds are going to be going toward missions. And you know what I've been doing? I've, I've been walking around my own house and, and looking at my own stuff and, and asking two questions. Question number one is, does this bring me value? Does this add value in my life? And number two, does, does this bring me joy? And looking at every item in my house and asking those two questions, and if the answer is no, there's, there's a good chance it's going to end up in the yard sale this year. And we, we run after things that are going to be put in the yard sale. I heard this story of some NCAA runners. You'll notice a picture on the screen Back in 1993, 128 runners lined up to compete in the NCAA Cross Country Championship in Riverside, California. Unfortunately, one of the turns on the 10,000 meter course was not well marked, and only five of the 128 runners stayed on the correct path. 
Mike Del Cavo was the first runner to notice the problem. He began waving at the other runners to follow him, but most of them refused and even started laughing at him. 123 runners took the wrong turn. Only five took the right turn. And Jesus says this is life. Jesus says that there's a wide path. And a lot of people are going to just mindlessly run down it. He says that only a few are going to find this narrow way. Be sure that you find it. Jesus says. Because Jesus says it's just not true that one course is as good as another. Look at Proverbs 14, 12. These words, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. And the race that you run can be a matter of life and death. So everybody is running after something. But number two, everything hinges on the track that you choose. In your notes, everything hinges on the track that you choose. In 1974, there was this new magazine that came out. The editors of Time magazine recognized this frenzy that was going on in our country. You know what the frenzy was? Is that we were so, we were chomping at the bit as a nation, as a people. We were chomping at the bit to get information about celebrities and what was going on in the lives of celebrities. Aren't you grateful we don't do that anymore? Aren't you? I mean, praise God, we don't do that anymore. Nobody does that anymore. But in 1974, this, this appeared to be a problem. And not just a problem, but actually something that the editors of Time Magazine thought, you know what, we can make a little money on this. And so out came a new magazine called People. In 10 months, 10 months, now I'm not getting on to y'all, anybody who subscribes to that magazine, all right? So just... But in 10 months, that magazine had over 1 million subscriptions. In 10 months, back in 1974. And the editor of the magazine, the editor had four rules. Four rules. How do you get on the cover of the magazine? How do you get in the magazine? What sells? He said four rules. Number one, young is better than old. That was rule number one. Number two, Pretty is better than ugly. That was rule number two. Number three, rich is better than poor. And number four, having just died is better than anything. That was his, that was his four rules. And that's how, that's how he decided what would go into the magazine was based on those four rules. And the reality is, is that we've been tragically reminded of that over the years. Let me ask you this. Do you want to run that race? Is that the race that you want to run? Is that the race that you want to ascribe to in your own life? Because several have adopted, we laugh, but several have adopted that very philosophy in life. That that is the race that they are running. And that race doesn't produce winners. That race produces warriors. Not warriors with W-A, but warriors, W-O, worry-ers. Why does it produce worry-ers? Because we're constantly thinking, that person looks younger than I do. I need to get up with the times. That person looks is prettier than I am. I, I, I need to do something to make sure that I'm, I'm keeping up with what they're... That person is richer. They have a bigger house. They have a better car. They have a better job. They, and, and we just constantly are aimlessly running at that race, trying to, to uh, get into a, a, a point of life where we just say, oh yeah, I, I, finally, I finally arrived. And then we realize we get there and we haven't arrived. Look what Psalm 16, 4 says. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. Because, my friends, Satan, he wants you to put your mind on autopilot. Satan wants you to jump on that wide road and just mindlessly run with the pack. 
But the word of the Lord says differently. And you get to choose your race. You get to choose what you're going to run after. I, I want you to look at this picture. This is a picture of a gentleman named Ryan Hall. Now, we actually have a Ryan Hall that, uh, that goes to church here, but this, this is a different Ryan Hall. Ryan Hall became the first person in the U.S. to run the half marathon in less than an hour. Folks, what I'm telling you, he, see, he ran 13.1 miles in less than an hour, 59 minutes and something, okay? I can't even drive around, I can't even drive 13 miles in Birmingham traffic in less than, than an hour. And he, he ran 13.1 miles in less than an hour. Uh, Ryan is a believer, and uh, he, uh, he, he actually tried to run the one-miler when he was in college, and he, he ended up always coming in last. He was always coming in last in the one-miler. And so he prayed to God, Lord, I don't care what event I do. I just want to do something, an event where I can give you the glory. He said, I just want to do what you have wired me to do. And the reality is, is that Ryan found out that he was not wired to run short distances, but that he was very much wired to run long distances. And so he began running the way that he was wired to run. He chose, he chose the race for which he was created. He changed course. But there's more to that story, more to that story because he, I told you he was a believer and he was training in California for the Olympic team. And just a, a few years uh, went by when he was doing this training and he was actually training in higher altitudes with the team because I hear runners tell me if you train in out, higher altitudes, it's better to condition your body and all that. But he was training with the team in higher altitudes. But then he decided that, that since his church was located in a, a lower altitude part of the region, he decided that he was going to stop training with the rest of the team up in the higher altitudes, and he was going to start training in the lower altitudes where his church was because he said, it's more important for me to grow as a disciple than to grow as a runner. I can't be my best me if I'm not with my church. And so he still made the Olympic team even in the midst of all this, but it even gets better through his running he raises awareness for the need for clean water in Zambia and that money that he raised goes to digging wells for clean water for people and when he was in Zambia with his wife he had a gentleman walk up to him and say I just want to tell you that the Lord has used you in a mighty way that because of the clean water that I now have available to me he said I am probably going to live 10 years longer and he said not just that but my kids are going to have clean drinking water for the rest of their life. And Ryan said that there is no medal that they have put around my neck that had more worth than that statement from that gentleman. He's found a better race. And that's why Paul says in Acts chapter 20 verse 24 to the Ephesians elders he says I consider my life worth nothing to me I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace see everything hinges on the track that you choose and lastly number three everybody needs grace to run a good race everybody needs grace to run a good race how many people need the message of grace raise your hand how many people need the message of grace we all depend on the grace of God to keep going it's not by our grit it's by the grace of God and the race you choose is actually impacting other runners have you ever thought about that the race that you choose is impacting your spouse men can I talk to the men for just a moment the race that that you choose is impacting your your life 
The race that you choose is impacting the life, if you're married, of your spouse. The race that you choose is impacting the life of your children. The race that you choose is impacting the life of your coworkers. The race that you choose is impacting the life of your neighbors around you. The race that you choose is impacting the life of the people in this church family. Now, women, that goes for you, too. The race that we choose is impacting the life of others. I want you to look at this last picture here of a gentleman named Stephen Siller. On September 11, 2001, Siller was driving to meet his three older brothers at the Glenwood Country Club golf course where they were going to, to play golf that day. Siller, being a firefighter, had his scanner on and was listening to the events as they unfolded and the disaster that was occurring at the World Trade Center. And so Siller decided to turn around his vehicle. He called his wife. He told his wife that I will, I will not be able to go and play golf with my brothers. Tell them I'll meet up with them later, but please just let them know I'm, I'm going to meet up with my squad, squad number one. And we're going to see how we can help. And the story tragically ended with, with Siller not ever making it to the golf game. Matter of fact, Siller never even made it back home to his family. He died trying to save other people. And there's something inspiring is there not? There's something inspiring about someone turning around. There's something inspiring about a change in course direction. There's something that, that comes over us when we recognize that, that we, we do have the opportunity to change course. And even, even in a, a story like this where where this gentleman had, he had it all planned out. <laughs> I mean, he was, he was going to play golf, and it was, it was going to be a, a smooth, textured day. And all of a sudden, in a moment, life changed. And, and here's, here's the reality of what the enemy, I want you to hang with me, and then we'll close, I promise. Here's, here's the reality of what the enemy wants to tell you. And what the enemy is constantly trying to tell us each and every day, the enemy is trying to tell us every day that, that you can't change. Or, he's even craftier that. He's telling you that, you know what, you can change. Just don't do it today. You can change next year when it's a more convenient time. You can change when you get that new job. You can change when you, when you get that new amount of money that you needed. You can change when you get that, that next house. You can change when you get... When, when your children finally get out of the house, you can't change. And, and Satan, notice how crafty he is. He, he, never, he, he almost rarely, in my life, he almost rarely says, says you can't change. He, he, he oftentimes comes in and says, yeah, this is just not a good time. This is just not a good time for us. Just not a good time. But aren't you grateful for Jesus? I say a few heads nodding. Aren't you grateful for Jesus? See, Jesus comes along and says, you can change because of me. Not because of, of me, Brett, your preacher. You can change because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. That Jesus comes down, he puts on skin, he puts on flesh, he becomes the God-man, he lives a perfect life. A life that we get to follow. He runs the perfect race, this Jesus. And he shows us how to run this race. And the whole time, Jesus never, ever says, please accept me. He never asks anybody to accept him. 
What's his call? Follow me. Follow me. Run this race with me. And by his grace, you and me, friends, can can run the race. So every week that we gather, the invitation is to Jesus. It's not to an organization. The invitation is, is, is not to a, some philosophical thing that we've manufactured. The invitation is always to Jesus. Folks, you're invited to Jesus. You're invited to Jesus. You're invited to Jesus. And so this morning, as we sing this song of invitation that we call it, we want to just give you some time to have alone with, with you and God. And if there is something on your heart that you want prayer for, we have shepherds that stand ready to, to meet you there. Because that's what shepherds do, and they would love nothing more than to be able to pray over you. They want to serve you. They don't want to embarrass you. They don't want you to call you. They want to serve you and pray with you. That's what shepherds do. And so if you have a need this morning, you can, you can respond publicly. You can do business with God right where you're at. Or you can meet with a shepherd right back here in this room in a private setting, and they'll be happy to pray with you and talk with you. Whatever your need is, don't wait. Don't wait. Because of Jesus, you can change your course today. Please come as we stand and sing this song. My only hope is you, Jesus. My only hope is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only hope is you. My only peace is you, Jesus. My only that you'll spend some time in your connect groups uh, this afternoon or this evening or sometime this week. Uh, you'll notice in the worship guide there are some questions uh, there that go along with the sermon. Uh, so if, if you're in a connect group or not in a connect group, uh, I encourage you to take a moment to look at those and reflect on those this week. We'll close out with this song and then be dismissed. Thank you all for being here today. We hope you will make plans to be back with us next Sunday and uh, do spend some time with your connect groups today. We'll close with this song. I stand to praise you, but I fall to my knees. My spirit is willing, but my flesh is so weak. Like the fire in my soul, when the flames make me whole. Like
the fire in my heart again. So light the fire, light the fire in my soul. God, thank you for being with us today, and thank you, thank you for allowing us to be in your presence and to worship you. We're thankful for the series that we're beginning today, and we ask that you'll bless us as we study about the race and make the choices about the races that we run and the things that we do to prepare ourselves to run that race each day. And we're thankful that you run along with us and you lead us and that you are standing there waiting for us at the finish line when we get there. And God, we are thankful for this day. We ask you bless us as we leave. Keep us safe and bring us together again next week. It's in your son's name we pray and we all say.